Hello everyone, Lloyd Reber here again with my next Q workshop video. Now that we have a solid practical understanding of what Q methodology is and the procedures needed to conduct a Q study, it's time to step back and consider some of the theoretical foundations of Q. Understanding the theoretical foundations of any research methodology is important to understanding the many assumptions that one makes when using that methodology. As we have already mentioned and alluded to many times in this workshop, Q is based on many assumptions that are very different from most other uses of statistics in educational research, which we have referred to as R methodology. So let's begin to take a look at the core theoretical and philosophical foundations of Q. I think these are the five most important theoretical foundations of Q methodology. First is the adaptation of Spearman's fact analysis. Uh, in order to focus on a by-person analysis as compared to a bivariable analysis. Second is the theory of subjectivity. Third is concourse theory. And fourth is this idea of self-reference. But this particular video is going to focus on abductive reasoning or abductive logic. Now, before we uh, launch into this, let me give you a little bit more advice on the theoretical foundations of Q methodology. I think anyone who is trying to understand Q should also uh, understand that Q is most closely aligned with the philosophical and theoretical foundations of qualitative research approaches. And as you read the Q literature, I don't think you're going to find this assertion made quite as directly as I'm making it here. But this is based on my own understanding and probably because I work at the University of Georgia where we have such a strong qualitative research uh, tradition. And I think of these uh, five foundations of Q, I think abductive reasoning is one that is uh, uh, very much aligned with, uh, with qualitative research approaches. All right, well, let's dive into this thing called abductive reasoning. From uh, Watson Stenner, uh, here are a couple of quotes about the logic of abduction. First, they say that observations are approached as clues pointing towards some potential explanation. And yeah, in other words, a hunch. And I really like that word hunch because I think it describes very uh, uh, correctly or appropriately kind of what the feeling is that we have. As human beings, we do have some uh, wonderful powers of uh, perception and also intuition. We have to be careful, of course, when it comes to that. We have to back up our hunches with, uh, with data. But uh, abduction lends itself to what are the clues, and we start coming up with our own reasoning that might say here might be a potential explanation of that. They also say that abduction is a logic designed for discovery and theory generation, not for testing and theory verification. Now, this is not a presentation on design-based research, but you will see in that literature that they talk a great deal about humble theories because it's the very same idea. You're looking for some understanding of um, design principles that might help to explain why one of our designs may or may not be working. And then you test for those hunches that your conjectures maybe to see if they actually uh, hold up. So this idea of abduction has a lot of power and applicability for many aspects of the, the work of an educational researcher. Now, it's likely that uh, you have not heard of abductive logic before, but I bet you probably have heard of deductive logic and inductive logic. And for somebody like myself who works in the field of learning design technology, there is this thing called instructional design, which is uh, very important. It's a, it's, a, it's a very much a fundamental part of our curriculum and our practice uh, as a field. And instructional design, by and large, is based on a deductive approach, meaning that we put together a lesson based on what we know about the world or about a particular topic. We know what is true. We know what will actually work. And we want to teach people how to do that. So we basically are going to give them the rules and then we're going to ask them to practice those rules in order to learn those rules for whatever the situation might be. In comparison, you would have inductive logic where what we're going to do is maybe throw people into, the, into a situation and say, well, what's going on here? Can you figure out what the rules are? Can you induce what is actually happening? So you're starting off with very specific observations, hopefully then leading to a very general conclusion.
So abductive logic is going to start off with very much incomplete observations. You, you're going to have a smattering of observations or clues by which to go by, and you start making some predictions. And, of course, you have to then maybe do some testing or some kinds of follow-up in order to understand, am I on the right track? Now, in everyday practice, I think all three of these are going to be working side by side. I don't think it's ever going to be a pure one or the other. But as I say, I think understanding abductive logic a bit by first comparing it to deductive logic and inductive logic is a really good first step. And as a little side note here in my own career, I've been most interested in inductive approaches to uh, design. It's not that I'm against instructional design. It's just that I have been really fascinated with those opportunities or uh, approaches where we we don't take away the joy of discovery and invention from students and instead give them a learning environment where they are actually learning something but they are the ones who are discovering it uh, or inventing it uh, on their own and i've i've used play theory as a way to guide that particular work so again i'm not against instructional design but i guess i'm about uh, understanding when instruction is not necessary versus when it is most needed and it's always good to try to understand this more with an example. So let's try to take the example of electrical circuits in trying to see the difference between deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning or logic. So, you know, here's a simple electric circuit. I'm sure uh, all adults know how this works, of course, and you, you know, you don't have to be a physicist to understand something about the flow of electrons and completing the circuit. You have a switch, of course, if it's on, you're going to have the flow uh, of electrons coming from the battery going in a loop, hitting the, uh, the light bulb, and the light bulb turns on. Now, if I want to teach that, what I might do in a classroom, which is really typical in most classrooms, is a deductive approach. So you can imagine all the different uh, lesson plans that have uh, existed to try to teach students how it actually works. And so you're really giving them the rules right up front. Here's how an, a, an electric circuit works. We're going to teach this to you today, and then we're going to practice how it actually, um, uh, to make sure you actually understand how it works. So I'm taking out the thrill of the discovery here. I'm saying as the teacher, I already know how it works, kids. So let me teach it to you, and then you're going to walk away knowing it also. Now, in comparison, an inductive approach would be to, for me to say in a classroom, uh, hey, everybody, uh, I want to light up this light bulb. And... Uh, I'm not sure how to do it. And I brought a whole bunch of stuff for us to uh, try to figure it out. And, uh, you, you know, you just kind of put it all on the table and you let the, uh, the students uh, start, to, start to mess around with it. And uh, pretty soon they start trying out different approaches and they start uh, testing, you know, how to, you know, connect things up. They probably know something about a battery and, you know, how they have to get the light to uh, be connected to the battery. And so you can imagine all the materials I might put in front of them. Now I put out their spaghetti and pencils and rope and wire and string, aluminum foil, and trying to figure out, well, what's the best way of doing this? So at, at some particular approach, you might say it's like trial and error. I'm going to be trying out all of these different things. And does the light bulb light up or, or does it not? And you can imagine uh, a group of students stumbling uh, across the correct answer and putting together the, uh, the battery and perhaps the wire or maybe the aluminum foil to connect to the light bulb and, and voila, it actually lights up. But then the question is, well, why? Uh, what are your humble theories about why this actually, this actually works? And again, if it really was a trial and error kind of thing and they stumbled across the correct answer, they might then say, well, you know, it might have something to do with the materials that I've used. Is it if it's stiff versus uh, very loose? You know, so uh, the spaghetti is very stiff, whereas the uh, uh, the rope is is not, but or the string is not. But the wire, you know, something about the the the, uh, uh, the material itself. Well, the wire is very stiff. Uh, it bends, but not very easily. And But why does that also work along with the aluminum foil? But you see the point that you're beginning to build some humble theories, and then you test those out to see which of those particular theories uh, holds up uh, under scrutiny. And like I say, it, it, in everyday practice, it's not going to be 
one type of logic at a time. I think all three are going to be working uh, some simultaneously, but the question of of why this works may be one that needs to be triggered. Either again, a, a very inquisitive student might be asking that question for themselves, or again, the teacher asking the question and having the students really really struggle with that. Now we can have some fun with this idea because there are lots of games out there. I think one of the that kind of deal with abductive logic in some respects. It's been a long time since, since I've actually played the the game of Clue, but it's, again, trying to figure out who who's the murderer. So uh, we have this uh, game of moving around the room uh, of a house, the rooms of a house, and, you know, the, the classic thing of uh, who did it, in what room, and with what weapon. So uh, was it Colonel Mustard with the, uh, with the pipe in the library, for example, and you start building up a, uh, a set of predictions of who it might be based on how the gameplay is actually going. So it's kind of a fun example, I think, of, in, of abductive logic. And there are some really interesting examples from history of the use of abductive reasoning. One of uh, the best is the history or the story of the discovery of the planet of Neptune. And so uh, there was... Uh, something weird going on with the uh, the orbit of Uranus, that it was being pulled slightly out of its normal orbit. Why is that? Well, this fellow named uh, Alexis back in 1821 had a hunch that uh, there might be an unknown planet out there that was, uh, you know, having an effect on it. Now, there was no evidence um, to suggest there was a planet other than uh, perhaps uh, that would explain this anomaly of the uh, of the orbit of Uranus, and this guy named Urbane in 1845 uh, used some calculations. If this hunch was correct, to f- tell the astronomers where to actually look in the sky for this unknown planet, if it's actually there at all. And yes, indeed, there was another planet there that they named Neptune. Another really famous example is about uh, the cause of a very serious cholera outbreak in London in 1854. And there were, you know, a a lot of theories about what was causing this disease that we now call cholera. And uh, some people thought it had to do with, you know, vapors and things you were breathing. But Dr. John Snow had a hunch that it was the water supply. And in order to try to figure this out, he drew a map of this one neighborhood in London. And uh, that's what you see here. And what he did was he put on this map all the places where we had the water pumps. Again, this is well before indoor plumbing. So people would go out to a uh, public water pump. You can see with those the P and the dots and go get their water to take home to their, to their houses. Now, he then decided to plot all of the deaths of cholera in this neighborhood to see if it would give him some clues about what was going on, particularly because he had a hunch about it being the water supply. And as you look here, you can see of all the pumps there, they seem to be clustering pretty much around the Broad Street pump right in the middle of the of the map. Now, interestingly, Dr. John Snow also was a bit of a qualitative researcher, and he went and interviewed many of the families where there were deaths that were far away from the Broad Street pump. And it turned out many of these families liked the taste of the Broad Street pump and went out of their way to go to the Broad Street pump in order to, uh, to get their, their daily water. And he took this evidence to the, you know, the city council or the city managers, the, the people who were in charge, and it was very persuasive. And they uh, took the pump handle off of the Broad Street pump. And within days, the cholera outbreak in this neighborhood in London uh, was over. And here's just one more example that comes from World War II. During uh, the war, there were, of course, planes going into battle. And uh, on the, uh, the Allied side, the question was where to put armor on the airplanes so that they were going to be less vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. And so when planes were coming back to base, they would investigate and kind of map out where all the bullet holes were or shrapnel holes. And they would try to figure out where to put the uh, the extra armor. Now, 
Abraham Wald, who was a Hungarian mathematician, had a, uh, a very unusual idea. His suggestion was to put armor uh, everywhere else on the planes, that meaning take a look at where all the, the damage would do, was done and put armor everywhere else. And you might say, well, that's really counterintuitive, except when you stop to think about it, because these were the planes that came back. The planes that were uh, destroyed obviously were hit in other areas that apparently were much more sensitive or vulnerable to some key systems. And so the planes that made it back give you a clue about the other places where the, uh, the damage must have occurred in those other planes. It's actually called survivorship bias. And I invite you to take a look at it, but it had an impact. Uh, it, it provided uh, a way to decide where to put more armor to uh, help these pilots be able to go on their missions and re return back safely to base. So the question is, what does abductive reasoning have to do with Q methodology? Well, it has a lot to do with Q methodology as it does for almost any re uh, qualitative research methodology. For Q researchers, uh, there's really two places where it really comes uh, to, to be important. One is in factor rotation. So the idea of exploring the factors, trying to understand what is a, a good solution, a good factor solution here for the data that I actually have in hand. Now, again, we tend to think about using Verimax for our rotation. But remember, Verimax is simply a mathematical solution. Verimax has no idea of the context. It has no idea uh, what's going on in this particular group of people. It simply applies a mathematical rule. Now, if you, as a Q researcher, know something about this particular group and you have some hunches about you know, where where these views are coming from, who are the influential people, and so on, this is where you will see in the Q literature the use of manual rotation so that you as a Q researcher can look for the best uh, factor solution by you manipulating the, uh, uh, the rotation of the data to see what makes the most sense. Again, based on your hunches. It also has a great deal to offer for factor interpretation. Again, for exploration. We are looking for possible explanations about uh, what these data are telling me, uh, how to understand the views that are being represented. And you do, of course, want to combine the, uh, the factor analysis data with any other qualitative data that you may have, such as uh, what you've gained through your observations of people doing the Q-sorts uh, or being able to have interviews of the individuals after they've done the Q-sort. So your skill as a qualitative researcher for observation and, and interviewing can re reveal a great deal for making sense out of factor interpretation. But again, it comes back to you as a researcher applying your own reasoning and the kinds of hunches you may have and then looking at the data to see if those hunches are actually backed up. So I hope you can now see the importance of abductive logic, particularly for the Q researcher. An important takeaway is to be mindful of the hunches you are forming as you conduct the research and to use those hunches to guide your decision making in these two critical areas of Q methodology.